So one day, a crowded airline flight was canceled, and there was a single gate agent at the desk who was responsible for rebooking the long line of inconvenienced and irritated travelers. Suddenly, an angry passenger pushed his way to the desk, slapped down his ticket on the counter, and said, I have to be on the next flight and I'd better get a first-class seat. The agent gently replied, I'm sorry, sir, I'd be happy to help you when it's your turn, but first I have to uh, serve these folks who are ahead of you in line. He wasn't put off. The angry pastor then asked loudly so that all could hear, Do you have any idea who I am? Without hesitating, the gate agent grabbed her public address microphone, and her voice bellowed throughout the terminal. May I have your attention, please? I have a passenger at gate 17 who doesn't know who they are. <laughs> if anyone can help him discover his identity, please come to gate 17. The folks in line laughed hysterically while the man gritted his teeth, moved back to his place in line. And although everyone was still frustrated the flight had been canceled, they approached the whole thing a little more uh, lightheartedly. In the biblical story we'll discuss today, we'll witness Jesus asking a question similar to the question that that man asked. Jesus will say, who am I? Right? But he wasn't doing it to try to push his weight around. Certainly wasn't doing it because he didn't know who he was. He was doing it so that he could help his disciples come to the right conclusion about his identity. Now, if you've been with us for the last month, you know that we're studying the life of Peter in a sermon series we're calling The Touch of the Master's Hand. And so far in the series, we've witnessed Peter having both his name and his occupation change, right? His name went from Simon to Peter, which means rock, and he went from fishing for fish to fishing for people. We watched as Peter learned some important first lessons Lessons about the spiritual warfare he would be engaged in. Lessons about compassion. Lessons about the need for spiritual recharging. And we watched last week. We learned that if you're going to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. And if you're going to continue to walk on the water, you have to stay connected to Jesus. Today we want to explore an important passage in Matthew 16 contains a number of controversial interpretations. Now, our reason for looking at this passage, this passage has nothing to do with the controversies and has everything to do with Peter growing as a follower of Jesus. Today's story begins in Matthew 16, verse 13, where the Bible says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, to secure the necessary privacy for this most important conversation, Jesus took his disciples to the extreme edge of the northern frontier of Palestine, to Caesarea Philippi. You can see it there on your map. It's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus used the term Son of Man to describe himself. Now, it's an expression that's found in Psalm chapter 8. It's also an, a, a name that identifies him with Daniel's vision of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And so the title, Son of Man, had prophetic and messianic elements to it. It wasn't meant to confer the notion that the person was human rather than divine, like we might think, the Son of Man. Is really a term that was ambiguous enough to disguise the fact that the Son of Man was indeed the Son of God. Now, Jesus knew all things. He wasn't asking the question for his own benefit. He knew what the religious leaders and the masses thought about the Son of Man. He also knew what the religious leaders and crowds thought about him. Nevertheless, to get his disciples thinking, he asked them the question, 
And he looked for their answer. So they answered, the Bible says in verse 14, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So when he asked the disciples what the crowds were saying about the Son of Man or about Jesus, they shared the three opinions of the crowd. Some say he was John the Baptist, or as I like to call him, John the Baptizer. You say, well, why would they think he was John? Well, you recall, Herod had John beheaded after his belly dancing stepdaughter made that request, right? And so Herod became conscious stricken and a bit superstitious because just after John died, then Jesus' notoriety began to increase and Herod thought maybe Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. Other people thought Jesus was Elijah. Why would they say that? Well, the Old Testament ends in Malachi with the promise that Elijah would come again, right? And he would issue in uh, the, the turning of the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So they concluded maybe Jesus is this Elijah person returned, uh, you know, to issue in God's work. Of course, in reality, who was, who was that Elijah? It was John the Baptist. Finally, others thought he was Jeremiah. And why Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, and Jesus at times showed his concern through weeping for Jerusalem, the condition of the Israelites, even the rejection of people of himself. So they thought maybe he's Jeremiah. But in reality, many people in our world today have no better understanding of who Jesus is than the people of his own day. Now think about this. If we were to go down to the streets of Syracuse on some busy workday morning and began to just ask the crowd, who do you think Jesus is? Those who would talk to us, which might not be that many, right? I'm guessing that those who would actually talk to us would want to say something complimentary about Jesus. Uh, there may be one in a thousand people who would want to say something derogatory, but most would like to say, well, he was a good man. He was a great teacher. Maybe even he was a prophet. And as complimentary as those things are, they fall so short of who Jesus really is that they're actually insulting. Now, the entire purpose of Jesus' first question was to lead to the second question. The Bible says, then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And, and can you just hear him emphasizing the word you, right? But who do you say that I am? In so many words, he's saying it's all well and good that you know what others think about me. But what do you think about me? See, that's the difference between it being an informal question, just an informational one, right? Um, what do people say about me? What information do you know about that? To a personal question. So the first question was informational, the second was personal. Now, does anyone else wonder how long the question lingered in the air? I, I like to think about this. But who do you say that I am? Scripture doesn't say how quickly Peter answered, does it? Did he... Think about it. Did he answer slowly or did he quickly answer? We don't really know. The Bible says in verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now when he said you're the Christ, he's saying you're the Messiah. He's saying, Jesus, you're the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. You're the one that we've been waiting for for hundreds of years. And now you've come. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just say, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. He said, you are also and the Son of the living God. He declared Jesus was God in the flesh. The only person to completely unite divinity and humanity into one person. Now, if you've ever sat around watching a TV game show, you know, with family, you know, one where you have to answer questions like, like Jeopardy, Right? Have you ever sat there and, and everyone's kind of scratching their head about the answer to the question? And then suddenly, like a light bulb goes off in your mind, 
you blurt out the answer, and it's the right one. And everyone looks at you like, wow, where did that come from? Right? And you even ask yourself, where did that come from? Maybe if you've had that experience, then you know a little bit about what Peter felt that day. Peter was probably surprised, just as surprised as the rest of them, how clearly and emphatically he answered the question. Now, Jesus wasn't surprised by it, and he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So after all Peter had seen of Jesus, after all he'd heard of Jesus up to this point, the revelation about who Jesus was came by divine inspiration. Not human comprehension, not Peter's own, own deduction. This came right from God. And it must have filled Jesus' heart with joy that his father had chosen to reveal this mystery to this simple, uneducated fisherman. And he declared that it was a blessing from God. It was not Peter's own doing. It was the work of God. But then Jesus used Peter's declaration as a launching pad to declare a number of important truths. The Bible says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And in these words of Jesus, we have some of the most powerful and hopeful words. But we also have some of the most misunderstood and misapplied words. On the hopeful and powerful side, let's look at those first. This is the first time Jesus mentions the church. And what does he say about it? I will build my church. The church was and is Jesus' church. It belongs to Him and Him alone. And in declaring it in future tense, I will build my church, we know the church didn't exist at that time when Jesus spoke those words, but it wouldn't be long. Fifty days after His resurrection would be the day of Pentecost when the Spirit would come upon the disciples and Peter would preach that first sermon and we have the first response, the first invitation, and the church began and Jesus began that building, right? The other part of the statement that's so powerful and helpful to me, hopeful to me, is, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus anticipated a long and weary conflict that would be carried out against the church. And this is visualized in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. The Bible pictures the conflict of the dragon, Satan, against the woman and her offspring, the church. In verse 17 of 12, it says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We get to chapter 17 of Revelation the battle describes who will be the victors. Verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. So no, no matter how long or severe the conflict may be, the outcome is never in doubt. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Satan will not win. The church will survive victorious. And this truth must have been a great encouragement to those first disciples who faced so much persecution, even martyrdom for the church, for their Savior Jesus. But they could face all that knowing that it would be worth it because the church would survive. You know, today we live in a time when the church has fallen on hard times. It's truly in decline. Some predict the church will die a slow death. Others say unless the church changes with the times, it will cease to exist. Jesus wants us to know that He will build His church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus will not allow His church 
to be lost in the world or lost to the world. The church will remain. We will remain faithful to the Lord and His Word. Now, the most misunderstood and misapplied words in Jesus' statement have to do with the role of Peter and these keys that are going to be given to Peter. Some people see in those words that Peter was the first pope and the church was built on him. Now, in the Greek, we see this play on words going on with with the, the word rock, right? Jesus had given Simon the name Petros, which means stone or rock, and he uses that term when he says, and you are Petros. But then he said, on this Petra, rock, which means a slab or a bedrock, I will build my church. So although Peter was a rock, he was not the rock on which the church was built. The rock on which the church was built is Jesus, the Son of God. And this truth that He is the Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. He is the foundation. He is the rock on which the church is built. And then in 1 Peter, the letter Peter wrote himself, right? He applies Isaiah 28, 16 to Jesus, saying, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. Peter knew who the rock was. He was a rock, but he was not the rock on which the church was built. Jesus and the truth about Jesus is the true rock, the cornerstone that the church is built on. But then Peter and the other apostles were to play an important role in the building of the church. They're the ones given the keys to the kingdom. Now, what are these keys? Well, what do you use keys for? Keys open and close locks, right? And so Peter and the other apostles are given the keys to opening the kingdom of God, extending the kingdom of God. And the book of Acts gives the history of them using the keys to open the kingdom of God to lost souls, first to the Jews, and then even to the Gentiles. Now, Jesus used the same words about binding and loosing for the other apostles that he does for Peter right here. So here in in Matthew 16, it looks like he's addressing Peter and saying, I will give you the keys and what you loose and what you bind, you know. But then in chapter 18, in verse 8, he says the very same thing to all the apostles. So although he's addressing Peter here, he's not the only one that's going to have the keys. They're all going to have the keys. And the binding has to do with what's forbidden, And the loosing has to do with what's permitted. And I think a better translation than what we have here is the translation that suggests whatever the apostles bind or loose on earth is what God has already bound or loosed in heaven rather than the other way around. And that makes sense, doesn't it? That God would be directing them what to bind or to loose rather than them telling God what to bind or to loose. And uh, we have several translations that have made that clear, like the old translation that's the uh, New American Standard. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been bound loose, had been loosed on in heaven. And, and then the Holman Christian Standard says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth has, is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. And the Net Bible translates it, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. So the responsibility for teaching God's truths for the church is going to come through the apostles by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Through their teaching and writing, the church will know what the church should do, and what the church should not do. What Christians should do in their lives, how they should live, and how they should not live. Now, in some respects, our story 
for today closes in a surprising way. Jesus has asked an important question. Peter, with God's help, has answered with the most important spiritual truth. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we would expect that Jesus would tell His disciples, yes, go tell everybody about it. But that's not what He says, right? The Bible says in verse 20, then He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that He was the Christ. Why would Jesus want them to keep this important truth a secret? The answer is it's not the right time for the world to know. And the reason it's not the right time is because there were so many different expectations about the coming of the Messiah in the first century. The idea that the Christ would come and reclaim and restore Israel had more to do with military might and political influence than spiritual renewal and revival. And so Jesus had not come to be the Messiah to make Israel a, a great earthly nation. That was not His mission. His mission as Messiah was to create a new spiritual kingdom through His death, burial, and resurrection. And if word got out that Jesus was the Messiah, before He was allowed to be the Messiah He came to be, this would only have caused more confusion and difficulty. And as we'll see in next week's story, even though Peter had made this great declaration, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we will see that he didn't really even understand what that meant for Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God. So Jesus he needed his disciples to keep this truth on the down low for just a little while until he fulfilled his true mission as Messiah. The mission of redeeming the whole world. Now, we've done a little bit of application as we've moved along in the sermon, but I want to finish with one primary application. The most important conclusion that any of us will ever come to in our lives is the conclusion we come to about who is Jesus. Who do we say that he is? Now, Benjamin Franklin, as you know, an important early uh, father of our nation, right? He uh, was truly a genius in, in many, many ways and for many reasons. But even geniuses can sometimes be foolish. Stories told about a friendship that Franklin had with the revivalist, George Whitfield. They were great friends. They spent many hours together. Franklin loved to hear Whitfield preach and teach. One day near his death, Benjamin Franklin said, Whitfield often prayed that I would be converted, but Whitfield has not lived to see his prayer answered. And then just before he died, Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale at the time, visited Franklin on his deathbed and asked him the question. He said, what is your opinion of the divinity of Jesus? Here was Franklin's reply. I do not believe that He is really divine, though I shall not take the time now to investigate it because soon I shall know for certain. Speaking of His impending death. How brilliant a man. <laughs> and yet how foolish. How can a person not take time to investigate an issue on which their eternal destiny depends. C.S. Lewis and others have elaborated on the fact that Jesus is one of the following. He's either a legend, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. The statements that Jesus made about himself don't allow us the luxury of just saying he was just a good man or just a good teaching. Because a good man or just a good teacher doesn't claim to be God's only Son. He doesn't claim to be the only way, truth, and life. The only way to the Father. Now, it's one thing to investigate the claims of Jesus, the proofs of his identity, and to decide not to become a follower of Jesus. It's another thing to investigate those claims and to decide that he is indeed the Christ the Son of the living God, 
but then to live in a way that's contrary or unworthy of who Jesus really is. When we come to the right conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we must be sure to live and serve in a way that's worthy of that claim. And we must be sure that we're keeping Jesus in focus so that we're reflecting and representing Him as He really is and not as we want Him to be. And this is what Peter's problem was that we'll investigate next week. He believed who Jesus was in theory, but he had his own ideas about what that ought to look like. And so who do you say Jesus is? And if you rightly say He is the Lord, then are you pursuing Him and obeying Him in a manner worthy of His Lordship? I hope and pray so.